On October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted 95 big questions which he believed faced the church of his day to a local church door in Wittenberg, Germany. 500 years later, I decided to post 95 new questions, one a week, to the web, questions which I believe the church must face in the 21st century. What is prayer? I've slowly learned that to pray any prayer is to do more, much more than recite some words. It's more than liturgy. To really pray is to allow the contents of your prayer to possess you. To allow it to become your vision, your passion, your longing, your commitment. As Soren Kierkegaard once said, the function of prayer is not so much to influence God, but rather to change the nature of the one who prays. The famous prayer that Jesus taught those who chose to follow him to pray begins with these words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To pray this great prayer is to allow it to shape you, to allow it to become the story by which you choose to live your whole life. So, what is this kingdom of God that Jesus asks us to pray will come? There's an old joke about the fact that what Jesus spent most of his time teaching about was the kingdom of God, but that what he got was the church. It's based on the fact that although Jesus only ever uses the word church on two separate occasions, both recorded in Matthew's Gospel, the first in chapter 16 and the second in chapter 18, he talked about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven all of the time, every day, almost every hour. In fact, he seems to have had a bit of a one-track mind. The Gospels record Jesus talking about the kingdom over 100 times. So back to the purpose of prayer. I've realised that Jesus' great prayer is really an invitation. An invitation to me, to you, to all of us, to follow him in the way that we live by joining in with the unfolding task of establishing the kingdom of God which is simply another way of talking about what life would be like if God were king, right here, right now, if his will was done here on earth as it is in heaven, rather than the will of the financiers, the marketers, the corporates and the politicians of flawed and self-centred people just like me. As Jesus' life teaching an example make plain the will of God is actually this, simply this, that every person, every community, indeed the whole of creation itself should flourish and thrive, enjoying peace and freedom from oppression. The kingdom of God is a way of doing things. It's a way of doing things differently where the excluded are welcomed and the hungry are fed, where difference is celebrated rather than scorned, where injustice is banished and greed is no more, where no one is oppressed or abused by anyone else, where disease is eradicated and joy and fulfilment become a reality rather than a distant dream. There's an ancient term widely used by the writers of Celtic spirituality. It talks about thin places. Places where the gap between earth and the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is said to be very narrow. Places where you can sense God more strongly than usual. The Celts taught that even ordinarily, heaven and earth are only a few feet apart, but in a thin place, the gap is wafer thin. In my view, however, the world is already filled not only with thin places, but with thin moments, with thin experiences, and most importantly, with thin people, where the poorest threshold between the two realities of earth and heaven are more obvious. It's too easy to assume that the story of the Bible understood best through the lens of the life and the message of Jesus is primarily or even exclusively centred around God's forgiveness of our sins and failings. 
By the way, it's worth saying that although the word sin is kind of uncool and out of fashion, except with the tabloid press, of course, who misuse it grossly, sin is actually a shorthand way of talking about our shortcomings, our screw-ups, and our general self-centeredness. In other words, everything that dehumanizes us, that messes us up, and reduces us and others. But the point is this, as wonderful as the truth that God is forgiveness, that God offers us forgiveness for our sins and failings, the truth of the message of Jesus, it seems to me, is even more unexpected and more generous than all of this. The overarching story of the Bible is nothing less than that the God of the universe is working to establish his kingdom of love, justice, inclusion and peace here on earth, where he calls as many of us who will to be his partners, his agents, to work with him in the great task of the transformation of our world. Now that is a real prayer. So over to you. What do you think prayer really is? And what do you think that this great prayer of Jesus, the only one he ever asked us to pray regularly, is all about? I hope you're enjoying Chalk Talk and the opportunity to think through and discuss some of the questions it raises week by week. And with exactly that in mind, I'd like to invite you to one of a series of events I'm doing around the country called In the Name of Love, the Bible, Gender Identity and Same-Sex Relationships. I'll be joined by some notable guests for this series of one-day conferences asking questions about what the Bible has to say about gender identity and same-sex relationships and what it means for us in everyday life. So often, in the church, we struggle to explore and to agree or disagree well when it comes to social issues. In the name of love will be different. Just like Chalk Talk, rather than being dogmatic, it will leave plenty of space for discussion and questions. So, no matter where you are on your journey with this issue, you are most welcome. I mean it. We'll be in Birmingham, Manchester, Sheffield and Southampton in the months to come. More details, including sponsorship to attend, can be found in the description on my Facebook page or at openchurch.network slash events. Once again, that's openchurch.network slash events.